It's a new year for stoners in Illinois. The first day of January marked the first day of recreational cannabis sales in the state. The Chicago Tribune reported that people were lined outside of the dispensaries hours before doors even opened just to get their hands on up to 30 grams of adult use cannabis. This and more on Chronic Economics. Welcome to Chronic Economics. I'm your host, Justin Pinson. We're here today at Electric Avenue, the original CBD dispensary of the Northern Arts District in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, if there's one way to describe stoners, it's dedicated. At 4 o'clock in the morning in Chicago, Illinois, outside of the Midway Dispensary, Josh Glekas was the first person in line to get himself 30 grams of adult use cannabis. But when he got inside, to his dismay, they told him there was a purchase limit of only three and a half grams, AKA an eighth. So he made it out with some sour watermelon gummies and blue gelato. So imagine you're not Josh, who decided to wait outside at four in the morning. You just stroll up to the dispensary and you see a huge line of people outside and now you gotta wait. And then when you get inside the building, some people had to wait up to about three hours. And this is across the entire state of Illinois. Now there were small glitches in the state database that they track all the purchases with, and that caused delays across all dispensaries as well. Some delays lasted up to 30 minutes. Another backup in transactions occurred with the price increase at the counter. Employees had to remind customers that taxes add up to 10 to 25% at the point of purchase, which caused some people to leave empty handed. We're going to talk about cannabis sales tax later, so that's a very important distinction to make. 43 different stores in Illinois are now licensed for adult use cannabis, and 10 of those are within Chicago city limits. If you're a crusader of the comment section, in a state where cannabis is prohibited, post right now how much money you think your state can make in two days of cannabis sales. You done? Illinois reported $5.4 million made in the first two days of cannabis legalization. With a population of 12.74 million people, how many adults are getting stoned? Can you imagine pulling up to the dispensary and seeing your high school teacher, the mayor, your old babysitter, and trying to get him to save you a spot in line. Another great thing to mention about the land of Lincoln's new recreational status is the 11,000 people pardoned by Governor Pritzker for possession of under 30 grams. Illinois stands out among other legal states by giving full pardons without an applicant approval process. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton was, quote, instrumental in efforts to help people with marijuana convictions by pardoning them as a part of the legalization process. This is why I had excited the staff at Sunnyside Dispensary when Stratton made a purchase of edible gummies at 6 in the morning. The staff gave her an applause afterwards and show of appreciation. As a spectator, I'm very impressed to see how well the rollout has taken place. Believe it or not, cannabis legalization could be coming to your area very soon. So I want to go over some data points with you that will help you understand what's going on in those legal markets. We're going to start by looking out west to what I like to call the Mecca of Marijuana, California. I pulled up these statistics in an LA Times article that will be posted in the link below. Since medical legalization in 1996, the California cannabis market went largely unregulated by the state. Fast forward to 2020 and we find that $3.1 billion in recorded state sales makes California the largest cannabis market in the world. Despite tight regulation passed in 2016 that they called Prop 64, you see it drove change on both sides of the industry. Keep in mind that 2019 state figures estimated $8.7 billion being spent on the black market of cannabis in California alone. Regulatory efforts have been slow at turning the tide of bootleg bud growers, so let's check up on the numbers and try to find out why. In Los Angeles alone, there are 10 illegal distributors to one legal, partially due to local bans on cannabis, which is allowed through Proposition 64. 76% of cities in California and 69% of counties have banned cannabis shops. That same regulation, Prop 64, also adds taxes and paperwork that drives the cost of one gram purchased legally at a storefront up 77%, according to a quote in the aforementioned LA Times article. Because of all of these factors, the first year of legalization in 2018 saw a $500 million decrease in recorded sales. Any person aged 21 and up can purchase or possess one ounce and eight grams of concentrate, while the number of edibles differentiates on whether you have a gallon of butter or a few candy bars. California licenses 538 distributors with shops and 263 home deliverers who function within legal parameters. Now what has all that meant for the state of California who's been counting on the tax income? NPR actually reported that tax revenues from cannabis fell short of what was projected. 
The first three months of 2019 gained $63.1 million in excise tax revenue from cannabis. The second quarter saw $74.2 million. Sales trended up, like we mentioned before. When citizens look at these figures, we think, you know, that's a lot of money. But the government of California actually expected to gain $355 million the first year and $544 million the second, which didn't really happen. Because the revenue helps to make budget projections, they had to change their numbers to $288 million in 2019 and $355 million in 2020. In the article by NPR, it mentions these figures as a sign of the cannabis industry struggle to take off. We're changing focus now to the Northeast, where cannabis legalization has shaped up emerging markets since 2016 when adult use cannabis passed alongside California. So smoke a bone for the homies in mass while we go over what the cannabis use laws are. Adults 21 and over can possess up to one ounce on their person and five grams of concentrate. At home, 10 ounces is allowed and anything at an ounce or over must be locked away or you can be criminally prosecuted. Cultivation allows six plants to be grown in the home and up to 12 for two more adults. That's 18 altogether. When it comes to transportation of cannabis, expect it to be treated like alcohol in consideration of open containers and vehicles and driving under the influence. Employers and landlords can make discretions on who can grow and use cannabis in their businesses. On November 20th, 2018, the first legal sales were made in Northampton, Massachusetts at New England Treatment Access. Northampton received $530,589 in tax revenue from NETA on the following quarter. These numbers come from an article dated in July of 2019, and they reported that NETA paid out almost $1 million by the end of the fiscal year. Remember, this is just one dispensary whose revenue is spread across the area after collection. The town's mayor estimated an income of around $1.2 million for 2020, taking into consideration that the industry is still in its early stages of development. Now, they are just one of 33 dispensaries operating across the state. Because of regulatory issues... New adult use dispensaries in Massachusetts are facing competition with, you guessed it, the black market. CEO of the company Theory Wellness stated in an interview with Mass Public Radio, it's a very difficult market right now to purchase wholesale cannabis to then sell it to customers. One of the biggest reasons that differentiate from California's problem is that they simply don't have a big enough supply of cannabis. The supply required to fill medical patients' orders was not sufficient for a recreational market to begin with. Add on to that required testing for potency, mold, bacteria, and pesticides. For those unaware of the vape ban passed in Massachusetts, imagine 20 to 30% of your recreational sales denied by the government and sent back onto the black market. To give a wider perspective of the industry, Kamani Jefferson of the Mass Recreational Consumer Council believes more than 50% of consumers in Massachusetts still buy illegally due to expenses or distance of travel, according to the same Mass Public Radio story. Massachusetts ended its fiscal year with a total of $420 million in cannabis sales and a recorded $2 million in tax revenue. Now imagine cannabis weren't federally illegal and California could just ship all their excess cannabis to Massachusetts. Or better yet, just look one state over. Borderline to Massachusetts is Maine, and this is a quick rundown of their recreational cannabis laws. Possession of 2.5 ounces per adult, 21 and up, that must be sealed in childproof containers when transported. Cultivation is 3 mature plants and 12 immature plants with limited seedlings as long as the tags bear grower's name, driver's license, or state ID numbers. And it's strictly prohibited to consume on public or federal land. Take into account Maine does not expect recreational sales to begin until March 15, 2020. And economists say that that's cost the state more than $82 million in taxes and 6,100 industry jobs, according to the Press Herald. Analysts in the industry estimate Maine's market to top around $158 million in the first year of sales and $252 million in the second. That sounds great, but the situation on the ground in Maine is one to consider. On December 23rd, the Press Herald published another article shedding light on how the state is facing a lab testing bottleneck. An issue has occurred because Maine's testing requirements are temporary and only checking potency, mildew, mold, filth, and harmful microbe levels right now. And the plan is to phase in pesticide, residual solvents, and toxins or harmful chemicals 12 months after the beginning of recreational sales. Now if I lost anyone, just think about it this way. Under the medical system that Maine started in 1999, only one consumer safety law applied, which is only minimum risk pesticides like cinnamon and peppermint oil are allowed. Unfortunately, Maine officials have no record of enforcing these laws or testing the dispensaries or caregiver products. Meanwhile, legislators in the state are still unsure of whether to make these set of test phases permanent. They await written testimony from citizens on January 6th, and the statute ends in February. 
Requiring different multiple levels of testing actually hinders chemists from opening test facilities because equipment costs range from $250,000 to a million dollars, depending on what tests become permanent. A grower interviewed in the December 23rd article, Scott Willette, claims he has his medical cannabis tested even though the state doesn't require it, and it takes a few weeks. His opinion is that if testing labs are not in place, and even if they are, higher prices associated with those regulations and taxes will drive consumers to the black market. Willette is quoted in the article. Maine has had a strong black market for a long time. We should license everybody, make reasonable regulations so everybody can play the game, and then we can compete with Main Street and not the black market. For anyone wondering why cannabis laws take so much time to be passed, there are your answers. It makes sense that Vermont took a different approach to legalization. Here's a rundown on their recreational cannabis laws. Possession is one ounce for adults 21 and up. Cultivation, two mature plants and four immature plants per housing unit. Plants must be enclosed and screened from public view. Harvested cannabis doesn't count toward the limit if it's stored on site and locked away reasonably. Vermont's actually not going to have an adult use market just yet. They feel like they don't have enough information to make the best decision for consumers, which is great. Check out an article by John Clark where he talks about how much he thinks you should tax cannabis at. He thinks that it's unfair to tax cannabis at things like 15-80%, which is what Vermont legislators have kind of talked about taxing it at. He thinks that you should tax it at around 6%, like they do alcohol. Why not, right? All right, I know that was a lot. But what we're going to do is start reviewing some of these numbers. Before I compare the four states that went recreational in 2016, I want to tell you something about Illinois that I didn't before. They have a population of 12.74 million people. In their first week of adult use, Illinois reported almost $11 million in cannabis sales. The population of California is 37.3 million people and they average $8.7 billion in illicit sales, possibly. That overtook $3 billion in legal sales. That's around $12 billion, yet again, the biggest in the world. They have 538 distributors and 263 home deliverers, and they actually took in $144 million in taxes if you add up all the state sales taxes for the second quarter. Now, illegal sales will still account for 53% of California sales by 2024, $6.7 billion in legal sales, and $7.6 billion in illegal sales in the future. BDS Analytics says that by 2024, they still expect 53% of the market in California to be illegal. In Massachusetts, they have a population of 6.6 .6 million people, and they had $420 million in legal sales because 50% of their market is assumed to be illicit, we can say they had $840 million in sales. And they only have 33 dispensaries operating right now. They stated their tax revenue was $2 million for the year. Maine has 1.34 million people, and they estimated that they would have made $82 million in three years from recreational cannabis, around $27.3 million per year. Now, the estimated total sales for the first year were $158 million. Vermont has a population of 629,299 with no sales yet. Notice that California has a population that is 5.6 times bigger than Massachusetts, but black market sales exceeded them by 20.7 times and 7.14 times in the legal one. I wonder how many out-of-state consumers shop in the California cannabis market. Some of those have to contribute to black market sales, but remember, 76% of cities in California and 69% of counties have banned cannabis shops. That becomes a better explanation to why illegal cannabis transactions will resume, analogous to John Clark's assessment in his opinion article. You gotta wonder if he's aware that California taxes cannabis distributors around 25%. If you look at the projections Maine has for its legalized markets, the numbers are interesting. Maine has a fifth of the population Massachusetts does and expects to make $158 million in its first year, around a third of sales that Massachusetts did. Lost tax revenue is estimated at $27.3 million per year. So Maine must have more taxes associated with cannabis than Massachusetts for that calculation to be correct. Because the states are so close, perhaps they expect out-of-state sales from Vermont citizens because they don't have a recreational market yet. In terms of cannabis prices, California, Mass, and Maine are around the same. On the black market, you can purchase an ounce for $150 to $280, opposed to $300 to $450 at the dispensary. Leafly published an article about Christmas specials in California where dispensaries had top shelf eggs for $30. Check that out to see what strains. Well, now that we know what to expect with legalization, let's go meet an entrepreneur who's on the front lines of prohibition fighting every day.
Thanks for being here today. Appreciate you inviting me, man. Yeah. So how much experience did you have in the cannabis industry prior to starting this company? Well, I mean, I feel like my experience takes in from when I started smoking. So I started smoking when I was, what, 13? I'm 38 now. So I feel like those are all my experiences within that whole time frame. Word. And uh, did you just become associated with it in the neighborhood? Were there like people, was it like a culture thing for you? Was it something you took outside of your culture? Uh, it was definitely a culture thing. I mean, I always saw people around me, but I never really smoked because I was always into like other things as far as like getting money. So I always wanted to make sure my mindset was, was clear. But I always felt out of pocket when they used to rap and um, every time they passed, you know, the blunt, somebody would rap. Um, so it was part of the culture for sure. I believe that it definitely felt something that I had to be involved in so that it could open up my eyes. And um, when I first started smoking, it definitely made me realize that I was missing out on a whole lot of, whole lot of things that I felt like before I smoked, I didn't know. So I think that it definitely opened up my eyes to see different things and uh, that's why I feel like it's definitely part of my culture, for sure. Word. So you spoke about uh, you liking to get money and everything. How does cannabis and getting money like just coincide and you, and how, did, how did it clash in your life at that point to well, create where you are today? Well, basically at this point, I just was on a, on a level where I always was working. You know what I mean? I always was working and I felt like, how can I make money where I'm not spending money on weed all the time? So yeah, of course I knew people that, you know, sold weed and stuff like that. So I always got looked out, but then I felt like I needed to get responsible and doing my own thing. So I started selling too and stuff like that, but I only really did it to take care of my, to take care of my, um, to take care of my, my habit, you know what I mean? Like, I just felt like I didn't need to be out there selling it because I felt like it wasn't really money that I needed at the time. So I just kind of did it just so that it can. So you didn't really extort the plant. You instead were trying to like have a relationship with the plant in a way. Correct, yeah. And make sure that it kind of like paid itself as I was doing it. And that's where my entrepreneurship started because I feel like a lot of people, you know, want to waste the, the money, I don't want to say waste, but it's it's a habit. It's a habit that you have, and it's part of uh, of, of it's part of your finances if you're a smoker. So I needed to come up with a way where I was gonna make money, and at the same time be able to smoke like whenever I wanted, so to speak. Word. Well, how does it make you feel then when people are now just joining this industry? You know, it's obviously a billion dollar more than over a billion dollar industry. How does that make you feel when people just get into it as a startup industry, as a way to make money, as a lucrative opportunity, what they think it is anyway? Well, in essence to that, I feel like when I started, you know, I had two jobs and I was just kind of like, okay, you know, the way that this lady, one of my jobs was a, a vegan company and she basically was setting up shop in her own little spot and, uh, just was selling out of Whole Foods, selling out of all these different health health markets and stuff like that. So I saw her way of, of her hustle and I kind of like brought her hustle towards my hustle and started, you know, figuring out ways of like, what can I come up with as far as we goes and, and make my, you know, make a revolution out of this, you know, because I've seen a lot of people starting to already do it. So I basically went ahead and... Um, reached out to some people in Cali and that's when I got introduced with the whole uh you know Weedos and um the Brooklyn Brokey which that was our original brownies and um we went from there it was our first two inventory things that we had on our inventory I mean if anybody looks at the site now they'll see three pages full of inventory but originally I started only with two items which was the the Weedos and the Brooklyn Brokies and um you know we took off from there and once I saw it, you know, the growth from there, I was just like, you know what? I really, you know, I actually got fired from one of my jobs. And then the other job, I kind of let go because this one was be like real busy for me. And she was okay with that, which was the, the vegan place I was telling you guys about. So um, 
at that point, like I said, I was just doing this full time. And it got to a point where it got lucrative enough where it's paying my bills and stuff like that. But I saw a lot of people try to kind of, I don't want to say do the same thing because I feel like everybody's entitled to do what they want. But, you know, you have to understand that I did this as an art. I did this as something that I felt like it was a movement. It was it was real. It was something that I wanted people to come back and be like, yo, I felt this shit. Like, you know what I mean? So at that point, I was just like, I hope these people are really doing it at a genuine, like genuinely doing it because they love doing it and not just for the money. Because I really don't do this for the money, honestly. And that's why I feel like I've, I've came a long way, you know, um... And when I say I came a long way, I mean, there's people out there that do this just for fun. Now, I mean, my first year, uh, I made over thirty thousand dollars, and I think that that's that's big for somebody who just you know started with two items. So that is what makes me different from everybody else because I feel like what I have is a movement, what I have is a passion, what I have is something that is genuinely real. And I think people see that when they meet me, and I think people um, gravitate to that energy. Word. So moving on then, if you were to per se, uh, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't uh, have to go through the issues right now with uh, prohibition and the legal market started to open up for you, you know, how much of your business would you have to sacrifice to basically, you know, get involved into, uh, you know, to make legalization faster for your for your operation? How much do you think we have you have to sacrifice and what are you willing to sacrifice? So if if your your question basically would be if like if we did become legal in the states like no say or, how would that see, affect me the way that it really works is you have to ask for permission so let's say the government allows it now okay okay are you well, how much of your how much of your business are you willing to sacrifice to make that happen uh, I wouldn't sacrifice anything like at the end of the day like I said from the beginning I don't do it for the money so I don't care how much money they try to throw at me or whatever the case may be. I wouldn't accept that. Um, now, as far as it being legalized, I think that it would help me. It would help me create stores. It would help me. Well, see, the reason I, asked, I don't want to cut you off, but the reason I asked is because we're talking a lot on this episode about how the black market is so prevalent. Right. And you're just giving an example of what you, what I said, like basically the answer to the question of why the black market exists is because you're not stopping because it became legal. And just because it gave you an opportunity to become legal doesn't mean you're stopping. Now, now you're just thinking about how you can become legal. Right. And that's, so, and that's one of the questions that I get asked all the time is, Yo, how are you doing this? So, you know, the answer to the question would be, I do t I do sacrifice a lot um, as far as it not being legal. Because, yeah, I mean, sometimes when I first started, I was like, damn, you know, is this something that do I really want to do? Because, I mean, banks sometimes not going to take your money. You're going to have to find loopholes to, to have your banks, um, to have your money in the bank. If you're making profits off your, you know, your business and um, even with CBD, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, why don't you take it to CBD? I feel like I generally started with THC. So CBD is not something that I would like to do, um, but I definitely have people that I represent as far as like uh, Satan's Breath. They have hot sauce, which is uh, CBD. And, you know, I, I, um, I feel like it's part of the movement, so I definitely go coexist with it. But it's not something that I would, you know, put my business with because it's not something that like makes me happy. You know what I mean? I do this because it makes me happy. How fuck with that? You keep saying that, so I believe it. <laughs> no, um, seriously though. Um, so, considering like like going back to this, okay? So legalization costs a lot, bro. Like you have to apply for permits that cost a lot of money. I think when the last time I read North Carolina law. Last time, I law, the last time I read a law for this state, I believe that the permit to apply to be able to sell edibles, I think it was around twenty five dollars or $3,500 just to apply. That's not saying you'll get that money back because you can be denied and they can take that money back. <clears throat> right. So you'd have to pay that every year, I'm pretty sure, to get your application filled. So you're talking about $3,500 automatically just to try to get approved. Then you, you have CBD to think about, though, right? CBD? No, 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 no. This is where THC would be legalized okay. because they've been putting, they've been trying to put medical bills to the state. Anyway. What, uh, the costs are like 3500 uh, The There's all kinds of insane costs and permit regulation tracking, all those things. It happens in every state. So are you willing to, are you willing to um, comply with that? Um, and how much time do you think it would take for you to comply? Like say you did want to comply 
and say you were willing to just like do whatever you had to do to like make your business legal, how long do you think it would take? Uh, it wouldn't take me no time. If that was uh, the sacrifice that I had to take to to pay the thirty five hundred dollars and make my pro you know my products legal, and you know would be able to be on front stream to be able to get on front line, excuse me, and be able to just be dominated the industry like all the other ones are. I would love to be in comparison with that, for sure. So, okay. so uh, it's something what, that what, I would do right away. I'm sorry, is you okay? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Did you say that one more time so it's clear now? Uh, it's something that I would do right away. Awesome. Uh, what would legalization look like? What would legalization look like if you were governor? Like, tell us about what kind of possession you would allow for. Uh, how much people could cultivate, the potency of marijuana you would allow people to have, the packaging you would imagine people should have to use, the distribution type of methods. So if I was ever to put in a position, like you say, like a governor or something like that, I mean, first of all, I don't even know if I would ever want to put myself in that kind of responsibility. Uh, just for the simple fact that I'm not really into like the politics and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Uh, but at the end of the day, if, if I was, uh, to be in those shoes, so to speak, I would definitely try to have the best of the best. I would try to have the same qualities that I find and I would make sure that everybody else is not. Can you give me a number on potency? Like say, would you allow for 30% THE? Would you allow limited? I would try, I yeah, I would try to get the highest percentages just because I know that this is what the people want. Um, and I would definitely have also mindset for the people that you know have the diseases and stuff like that that actually need it as far as cancer how much, as far how, as much would you, how much could you possess like how much like right now for example in california it's up to an ounce uh illinois is 30 grams uh, i think it's either maine i think it's two and a half ounces how much would you allow for i think i think a quarter pound if you're no i'm sorry i rephrase that i say if you're 18 the max should be an ounce you know what I mean? Because if you're over 18, like, you shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. That's just me personally. I don't have any kids, but I know for the parents out there, like, I'm, I'm trying to think for them. And if you're 21, I'd say a, a QP would be, like, the max that you could buy out of the dispensary. Because you shouldn't be going out there with a P because then your safety is concerned. Now, people know that you can have a pound coming out of the dispensary. And if you're a street dude... You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, you're going to think... So you, you do believe in a limit for personal possession and carry? Yeah, it's only for the safety of the customer. You know what I mean? Because you don't want customers... I mean, people that are thinking negative to, to think negative. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's probably more to more so safety for the customer. What do you believe about packaging? You know, right now, <clears throat> for example, in, in a lot of these legal states, if you were to have an, like, if you were to have weed open in a bag, like you're rolling up in your car, that's like open container of alcohol, basically. Essentially, you get a ticket for that. And you have to keep it sealed in childproof containers. Like, uh, would you do the same thing if your legalization was up to you? Well, I mean, generally speaking, right now, let's speak on packaging. Um, I don't know the owner of Runtz, but I'm sure he's on on edge as far as all the the people that are false claiming him and you know getting these bags on the site. I mean, obviously, it's good promoting because I mean they're promoting him, so it's definitely a great promoting strategy. But I wouldn't want weedos to be sold in, you know, I, I, Idaho or something like that and it not be the actual thing. And my thing is, is that so many people now are just buying different things and different packaging and, and selling what, what they call, down, you know, downgrade weed and, and grade D weed. And it's just kind of like it's messed up for the customer because the customer is actually thinking they're getting what they see. And... You're deceiving the customer is what, you know, and that's why we stick to our brand. We stick to our stuff and the customer is always happy because they're getting, you know, what they're getting. I actually got a question today about somebody, <clears throat> excuse me. I actually had a question today as someone asked me, you know, how do I know if I'm getting indigo or sativa? And I told her it depends on who you're getting your your supply from. If your supplier is not advising you what you're getting, nine out of ten times they don't even know, and that's why they don't advise you of it. Because I know if I have what I have and I supply what I supply, I want the customers to know what they have, so that way they know what mode they're in at the time that they're in. What know? about testing? Uh, 
for example, Maine is going through huge issues right now because they don't have the the way they want to do testing is kind of like limited, and they want to add more tests later. That's kind of bottlenecking how much actually supply of cannabis is allowed right now. Um, what would you do for testing? Would you like, for example, your edibles? Have these been tested? And do you know of any like uh, of any numbers or any statistics you can give for like bad quality uh, edibles and how you would like differentiate between what people can and cannot have? Well, as far as testing goes, obviously, you know they have companies and and stuff like that with facilities that that use high end machines to to test everything, and then they have testing uh, where you can test how much potency is a THC. But I mean, as far as the testing is concerned, I think that as long as the person, you know, sanitizes and makes sure that everything is, you know, up to par as far as like what they're using and, and knowing what they're doing, because a lot of people think that because, okay, I know how to get butter, I'm going to make cookies, then the cookies don't come out right because they may have left it there long. They probably didn't use the right temperature. They probably didn't mix the right products. So there's a lot to it than just testing something because i mean it goes more to just testing because i feel like let's say it tests great but then the taste is horrible you can't test taste you know what i mean what i mean to say so, is test is like for pesticides for uh, molds for things like so i guess it goes yeah, back to like what you would when you, for, when you would make you, it would you make that a required test for people to actually have to buy things? yeah definitely just like they have fda approved i would definitely have some some kind of team where they're checking to make sure that all these things that they're being sold how do you feel about sold. the black market and people having to be like right now like example you are on the black market well i mean it's going back to edibles too it's like vapes are horrible of course i mean i don't, I don't see vape on the table so like when it comes to edibles it's like how do you feel about edibles where people don't know if they're getting like some sort of pesticides or what cannabis it goes back to you know what i'm saying yeah that's sketchy because i mean a lot of people want to use low you know low ball cannabis because they feel like okay well you know any kind of cannabis that you use once you bake it it's going to get stronger well that's not really true you want to use the best of the best so that people can feel the best of the best it's almost like smoking good weed right so like if you're gonna if you're gonna buy good supply then obviously you're going to want to take in what you're taking in as far as getting the high so if you're going to use bad supply and feel like the customer is going to get the same kind of high off the person that they get their supply from, it's not gonna be the same. So obviously that definitely has to be regulated somehow, some way. But I mean, you can't control the black market, man. This has been going on since time was time, so. And that's what, uh, actually, you know, there's, there's, there's a conservative article. This guy's a conservative, right? If you're in Vermont. And um, Vermont's actually not allowing any uh, recreational or adult use market right now because they think that they don't have enough information on how to create a good one. Right. So. A conservative wrote an article saying that, you know, the black market is created when we have prohibition. Okay. So the reason I uh, bring up, like, what type of laws you would allow for is because you already said, you know, you would say people should only have a quarter pound on them, right? You think that's safe. But what if somebody's like, fuck you, I want to have a pound on me, and I'm going to do this thing. Mm -hmm. So how did, like, what, what, what would the repercussion, what kind of laws do you think you would enforce against that person? Well, I mean, to everybody to each his own. I mean, there's people out there doing it right now without any laws being... You know with laws being in play so people are gonna do what they want regardless but i feel like if you know you do get caught and stuff like that it should that don't matter the amount that you get caught with it should be a ticket because you know what i mean you, you shouldn't be around and you should be more cautious whatever you're getting pulled over for or whatever the case may be to even get to that point or get you to that point you should definitely be worried about some kind of repercussion or, or you know something because at the end of the day then you're gonna have people just you know what i'm saying doing things reckless because not everybody's gonna think right and that's why there's laws unfortunately um <laughs> unfortunately i like what you said there uh so just to go back to you and your brand you know how would you describe well how would how do you create appeal for your brand amongst rural or suburban customers? Obviously, obviously, it's urban bakery. Correct. So, how do you think you how do you think you appeal to people who aren't urban? And then, well, what do you think you can do to maybe change it if you don't? Uh, that's a good question. Well, what I feel like I try to stay consistent of the 
the contact that I pull out, the contact that I pull out and just like the weedos and like, you know, I'm always around like skaters and stuff like that. So it depends on what kind of community you're in. I'm very open minded as far as like cultures is concerned. So, you know, I like punk rock music. I used to listen to Nirvana music and stuff like that. So I can coexist to any kind of community, uh, whether it's punk rock, whether it's rave, whether it's techno. It's called Urban Bakery because it's part of a culture and it's urban so it's uh it's something that i feel like is just part of a community as far as the urban uh, society is concerned however it's open-minded to others and i feel like with the content that i pull out and with me being around skaters and stuff like that i think people are aware of that is we're open-minded to every you know to every uh community that's out there word i like that so when it comes to branding do you think that you appeal to more people uh, like in a nostalgia or like, do you think it's easier for you to gain a consumer's attention when you use brands that relate to actual food brands, such as like, you know, Weedos? Uh, or do you think, uh, do you uh, have any regards of how difficult it might be for somebody to create an entirely new brand and try to, you know, create an attention for that? Right. And like I said in the beginning, um, you know, it's all a passion. Uh, just because I create weedos doesn't mean that I thought, okay, I think people are gonna go, you know, go along with the whole weedos thing because of Cheetos. Because there's plenty of people that like Doritos or onion rings. So it's just kind of like just being creative and just believing in what you're doing. So if you have a passion for something and you know it's your art and you know that it's something that you're not, like I said, doing for the money then it's going to just kind of go hand in hand. It's going to just come to you as as something bigger than what you think. Um, I never thought that right now I'd be doing an interview, you know, starting off the new year, um, just for the simple fact that I very, I very much so worked hard. A lot of people say, well, how can you work hard of, you know, packaging stuff and stuff like that? There's a lot of stuff involved. I mean, you got inventory you have uh, shipping, you got packaging, you got to get make sure that all the inventory is there for the customers, you got to make sure that everything's being sanitized, everything works. So it's just, it's more to it if you like what you're doing and if you care. Um, if you don't care, and like I said, if you're doing it just for the money, you're just going to put it in, you know, uh, what's it, plastic bag. I've seen it in plastic bags with tape on it and it's like, I mean, you can tell when somebody is as dedicated or when somebody's just doing it for the money. So how does that make you feel as somebody who is dedicated, as somebody who believes in the culture, as somebody who is a real entrepreneur and somebody, like I said, you know, you, you don't really believe in being like the powerful governor, man. But like going back to what you believe about legalization, would you stop people who are obviously, you know, curbing good customer service, curbing quality you know, in safety and basically, would you, would you stop that? Would you not allow those people to be in the cannabis industry? I feel like they stop themselves because I feel like, let's say for example, a customer goes to, to one of these suppliers that don't really have a care for what they're doing or what have you. And they meet an urban bakery or they meet a smoke champs or, you know, they meet all these other great companies that are out there as well. They're going to see the difference. They're going to see what, what caring is. And, and then that person's not going to go back to that supplier. So it just kind of like it hurts themselves. And it's just going to get to that point where that supplier is going to say, well, damn, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to put the effort? Or am I just going to keep doing it like that? And if they keep doing it like that, they're going to see that their customers are not going to be there. They're going to see that they're going to have to maybe have a job in order to contain what they're doing. I really love you really you want to so, let the market regulate who should and shouldn't actually try to dictate, you know, cash flow in the market. But you do also believe in regulation for safety regards and for you know health concerns. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thanks for I mean, no, that's great, bro. I appreciate that. That's really solid. That's a good thing to say. Like you know, I like to get the basis of that. Um, I don't really have any much more, bro. Anything else you want to talk about? Anything in the future you want to you know speak on? Well, I just uh, want to thank you for taking the time to get to know a little bit about Urban Bakery and kind of how like, you know, we started and kind of like how we try to really support the movement. I know there's a lot of people that may think otherwise or may think that, you know, things may not work and stuff like that. We're always here to answer any of your questions and um, we're always here to, to make sure that people are understanding the value that we, we take 
upon Urban Bakery. So uh, thank you for giving us this time to uh, express on on that. Yeah, I'm actually gonna ask another question real quick because I forgot one. Lastly, I'm just to follow. Like I said, it's all about the culture here, and we love it. Um, how do you think that uh, what? How do you think the taboos are? Have you seen any taboos change that have came with legalization or the talk of legalization? You know, uh, do you see us moving forward or backward in the future when it comes to the cannabis industry and when it comes to the cannabis culture in America? I definitely feel like we're moving forward. And the reason why I say that with with so much um, like positive, like real positive about it, because there's so many people that are getting involved that are like me, that are part of the culture, that understand the culture, that the movement may, with the power that they hold and the power that they have, they're going to give other people the opportunity that we need. I mean, I was just actually uh, seeing an interview from um, Burner, and, you know, he's part of the culture. He's been doing this for a while, and he actually doesn't just sell cookies in his, uh, his, in his dispensary. You know, he has actually other brands from the culture as well, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you got people like Jim Jones, Wiz Khalifa, Snoop Dogg, like all these people that are part of the culture that are joining the movement. And this movement is real big. And I think that people like us who are going to sit there and control what goes what and what goes not, like hip hop, you know what I mean? It's just kind of like, it's going to be very hard to, to not be positive and not be going where it's going. I mean, it's growing every day. Illinois just got uh, recreational. Illinois did, did their failure first sales of recreational. So, but for example, their shortage is on butter serious. Um, and going back to like California, for example, right now, you have the fact of uh, taxes going up again when they're already taxed at 25%, right? So how do you change the taboo? How do you change the culture of cannabis being considered more Going back to this, this is another question I forgot to talk about, we were talking about it, but I lost it. In Vermont, they're not allowing for adult use recreational right now. There's a conservative uh, guy running for governor, and he thinks that you should tax it fairly at 6%. How do you change the attitude about cannabis so that people think, so so people will treat it fairly and not try to just extort it? Like, you know, people want to get, like, higher tax rates just because they know that cannabis is a high cash crop. Well, I mean, it's something that people got to understand. I mean, at the end of the day, this is America, and they're going to want their money. So, I mean, if, we, if we're going to have to be there making sure that we're not being, you know, smacked, we got to just make sure that we know the rules and we know what we're getting into before we sit down at that table. So, um, I mean, there's people out there that are already doing it and they've broken walls and um, there's no stopping us, man. Like, I hear McDonald's and other places like that, you know, corporations are already ready, but you think people in, in the culture are going to want to go to McDonald's? Yeah, probably so. But a lot of people... What do, you, what do you mean by McDonald's? Well, I mean, corporate America is going to really take over once this thing gets legalized everywhere. You think McDonald's like alcohol. Is so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> why not? Why not? I mean, we eating things that are... Well, I don't eat it per se, but people are eating things that they don't even know. So, I mean, uh, we got Impossible Burgers and stuff like that. I mean, come on. So you're going to tell me that if there's a, a Weedo McFurry or something like that, people ain't going to want to go in there and take that? I mean, come on. I see where you're going with it now. I see where you're going with it now. So, you caught me. Yeah. That was funny. Yeah, man. So It definitely, as long as we prepare ourselves before we sit down at any table or before you sign a contract, you're good. You know, you're good. I mean, you just got to know the laws. You got to know what you're going through. And that's it. I think that um, where are we going, it's definitely a good thing. I mean, I feel like everybody sees it, everybody knows it, and they can't. They're excited. I think a lot of people, what they are, is excited and anxious. You know, us weed heads, we we are very anxious people, and uh, so I feel that we're just all anxious to to wait for that movement to come. And I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad for you to be a part of it, and I'm sure that a lot of people viewing it. I'm glad that, you know, we're doing this because at the end of the day, we do it for the people, man. Like, That's awesome. Well, it's good to have you here, man. Appreciate it so much yet again. And uh, hope you're having a good new year. You too, man. Talk to you soon. All right. Yep. When it comes to living the cannabis lifestyle, education is key. It's hard for consumers to be educated when they have to shop in the dark. And that's why we created Chronic Economics to help break it all down for you. 
On the next episode, we're going to talk about flower bans on CBD and in medical states. So stay with us. Thanks for tuning in.